Um, so at this point, I think uh, we're going to invite our, our panel members up. The moderator, as I said earlier today, is Chris Graff. Uh, many of you here know Chris. Uh, he is presently the uh, Deputy Director of Communications at, uh, or the Vice President of Communications at National Life. Uh, but most of us know Chris for his more than 30 years in journalism in Vermont as the uh, chief of the um, Associated Press Bureau. Uh, you may know Chris or recognize him from uh, many years of hosting Vermont This Week on Vermont Public Television. He's also written um, Dateline Vermont, a history of uh, modern politics in this state, um, a well-known figure um, and the person that I had to turn to after our organizing committee said the theme of, of what we should do is uh, civility in, in politics in Vermont, I sort of panicked and I thought, well, now what do I do? Well, you ask Chris Graff, because Chris Graff knows how to get things done. And thanks to him, we have this panel assembled today, and I'm going to turn uh, the proceedings over to Chris and our panelists. <laughs> so uh, Jim Leach, Leach did not mention that he is in the National Hall of Fame for wrestling. That was not, uh, uh, so that's why wrestling is a special part of his life. He was the 1960 state champion in Iowa. So, so now on to the question of the day. It is uh, civility and political discourse in Vermont. How do we compare to the nation? Well, we know we are much better. There's no question here. We're done. Thanks very much for coming. <laughs> Um, one, of our, uh, one of our problems with this panel is they may be too civil. Uh, they're all very thoughtful people and they're, uh, in their lines of work they are too civil. And some of you may know from your reading of the Bible that the Apostle Paul is uh, very clear in his readings that love for people precludes being rude, uncivil, or inconsiderate. So we went out and got as many Pauls as we could to be on this panel. We could only find three, so then we got an Emerson, a Jeff, and a Deb uh, to, to fill it out. Um, we're going to start with a definition, and uh, I'm going to do this one alphabetically, so Jeff, you will be first, so that I can introduce you as I go along. Because I think one of us, we need a level playing field here to know, I think all of us, have different thoughts about what civility actually is. Um, you know, is it like what Justice uh, Stewart said about decency? Uh, I'll know it when I see it. So we want to know what these panelists think about civility. What is civility? What is incivility? And when do you cross that line? And we'll start first with Jeff Amistoy, former Attorney General, former Chief Justice, uh, and certainly one of the most thoughtful people, and he's, since he left the bench in Vermont, uh, he's been at Harvard, where he, at the Kennedy School of Government, where he thinks a lot. So we get the benefit of that right now. Jeff? Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I guess it's one. Um, yeah, I thought I'd start with, uh, when you talk about civility in Vermont, I think one of my favorite Vermont stories is of the two Vermonters going to a town meeting where the uh, issue, one of the issues before the meeting was to be whether or not the town should purchase a new town greeter. And one says to the other, have you made up your mind whether you're for or against? And uh, his neighbor replies, I have not, but I'm prepared to be bitter. <laughs> um, one thing I love, the thing I love about that story is uh, Vermonters tell it on themselves. And I think uh, one aspect of community and civility in Vermont that uh, perhaps distinguishes us from other parts of the country uh, is that we have an appreciation for independence, we have an appreciation for sp uh, spirited and even stride debate. But I think at the base of all that is is an understanding that of respect that comes from a place in which there's a, a reasonable scale and, and a sense of community. Um, the most famous judge never to be on the Supreme Court 
learned hand who was from just across the, the lake, Hans Cove, um, once said that the spirit of liberty is the spirit that's not too sure it's right. And it seems to me that that's a spirit that, uh, for the most part, infuses Vermont, and uh, I certainly wish infused the rest of the country as well. Paul Burns, Executive Director of the Vermont Public Interest Research Group. How do you define civility? Uh, well, first of all, uh, let me thank the Bar Association and all others associated with this. I want to be civil and respectful, and, uh, and thank you all for coming out on a Saturday morning, uh, and Chris for, for moderating. I guess from my perspective here, the one important thing to consider is, um, is something that, uh, that Mr. Leach mentioned, that civility should not be um, uh, mistaken for being a, a patsy or, uh, uh, or lacking in, uh, in spirited debate. Uh, and, in, and in my case, I run a, one of those uh, less well-known 501c4 organizations, um, and we engage in public advocacy. And, um, and oftentimes we do so in a very passionate way. Uh, but I, I think that one um, distinguishing characteristic that, that crosses the line into incivility, at least in my opinion, is one that, that personalizes a, um, uh, a, a, an attack, for instance, uh, where you start to describe your uh, political uh, opponent in, in terms that uh, disparage that person's character, for instance. Um, so it's more than a lack of even respect for their position on the issues, but a, um, uh, a personal attack, which, uh, which benefits no one, of course. And um, I think that uh, uh, is something that really we ought to try to avoid, um, if, certainly if we're going to maintain any kind of civil dialogue. So, so I think it, the important f uh, fact from my uh, perspective is that we can have very, very spirited debates. Um, and I think our, our congressional delegation, our federal delegation proves this. Uh, we have all the way from Senator Sanders, who is a, a, a very, very passionate advocate, um, who I think proves that you can be that kind of an advocate without crossing the line into incivility. Uh, and, and then Senator Leahy, who of course experienced a moment of incivility by our uh, vice president uh, on the floor of the Senate. And, and didn't respond in kind, but demonstrated a kind of leadership there that, uh, that shows uh, that one can rise above that. Paul Costello brings a view from our communities as Executive Director of the Vermont Council on Rural Development. Paul, what's your view on civility and incivility? We may not have more civility or more dedication to community, but we think we do. <laughs> We're really proud of it. Um, it's essential to our sort of psychological identity as Vermonters, I think. And when I think of civility, I think of it as a process, not a thing. And it's sort of the process of a feeling of mutuality, of mutual ownership, of common dedication, of a sense that we have first principles as a people, that there's a unity behind the things that we disagree. And we go to that unity to find common ground rather than just argue from our points of division. If we don't have common ground, we don't function effectively as a democracy. And I thought that that was uh, very well put in the, uh, in the opening, that, that the process of dialogue and listening and kindness to neighbors and appreciating uh, the, the uh, the best side of those that we interact with at the, at the community level are kind of the foundations for democracy. And that sort of sim, uh, civility is, is not just politeness, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's sort of the foundation for democratic action in, in Vermont. So Paul Gillis has a centuries long perspective on Vermont. When I, <laughs> he hasn't lived that long, <laughs> but in his head he has. And every time when I was a journalist that I would write, this is the most negative campaign in Vermont history, uh, Paul would take issue and he would cite something from 1840. And of course, he was right. Paul, your thoughts on civility? Well, I come at it from the perspective of the moderator at the town meeting of, of Berlin. And it's a unique perspective because I get to see, first of all, I get to see all the faces and I get to make the choices as to who speaks next. And what I see is a, a process. I think if we're, we're, I don't know that we're more virtuous than any other culture, but I think we have 
developed over the years, especially in the towns that still retain town meeting, an ability to what we call reasoning together, an ability not to necessarily to give up our own positions, but to at least listen to what the other is saying and to res respect the idea of the minority and the minority's rights. As a moderator, there are many who want to talk who have not been schooled in humility and reserve, who have strong passions. We don't kick them out of a town meeting. We listen to them. We listen to what they have to say, and we, uh, and sometimes what they have to say has meaning. And if, if civility has any sense at all, I think it's the ability to remain open to be persuaded to some other uh, point of view. If civility is only treated, as, as uh, Mr. Leach said, as a matter of uh, being polite, I think we also have to appreciate that times are changing, people are changing, the internet is changing the way we think, there's a, a greater diversity of opinions, and I think a, a greater uh, appreciation for uh, I would say a, a growing intelligence within the uh, the general population, which is reflected directly in town meeting. But it's 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 not uh, it's never going to be calm. I don't want a town meeting that's calm. I want it to be rough and ready and and dynamic. Emerson Lynn uh, uh, brings the view of both communities and from the news media. Emerson is the editor and publisher of the St. Albans Messenger. Civility. Well, I think one of the advantages that obviously Vermont has is uh, just one scale and its size. Uh, you know, in Vermont, uh, particularly in the, the political sense, we're so small uh, that we really don't afford uh, our leaders a, a place to retreat. Uh, they, there's no place of safety. Uh, and, that's, and that's really a good thing, uh, you know, in my own community as well as all the way through uh, Vermont. Uh, you know, if you say, and particularly in my profession, I mean, I write, I write editorials uh, you know, for, for a living. Uh, if I'm particularly negative uh, about, you know, the governor or whomever, whether it's Deb Markowitz in, in, her, in her position, I will hear from that person, and I will hear from that person next week, and if I don't hear from them, from them uh, I'll see them personally, because you can't escape that, and that's, that's a lovely thing, and that also exists uh, with, our, with our local representatives. You know, we just, I, one of the, uh, you know, referring back to uh, Mr. Leach's comments, uh, you know, I had my beginnings in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, many years ago uh, with, I had served as a speechwriter for two Republican senators. And uh, back in that time, I, they were known as Wednesday Club Republicans. And Wednesday Club Republicans back then uh, were a group of, as the names are Jim Pearson, uh, uh, Lowell Weicker, Jake Javits, uh, some of these people. It's kind of referred to now as the golden years of the Senate. And what they did uh, on a weekly basis was they met on Wednesdays. And these guys were the moderates, and they don't exist uh, today. But they talked, and their, their goal was to involve both sides of the political aisle, uh, both Re Republicans and Democrats. Uh, you know, the, it, just an interesting aside that, you know, our uh, the other person in the delegation was Bob Dole. He was the other United States Senator. Back then, he was not an honorable man, and he was the hatchet person of the Republican Party, and he was the divisive one. And today, good Lord, uh, you know, he's as far to the left as you can get in the Republican Party, which is just astounding to me. Uh, but, you know, in, in Vermont's sense, uh, we have this commonality where, you know, everybody is so close, and there's there's this, this need you know, to deal with each other. You can't escape that, and I think that's really one of the things that's important. Uh, to be a bit of an outlier on this, am I worried about Vermont and, and, the, and the civil discourse? I, I really am. You know, I, I do worry about what's, what we have in front of us. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of breakdowns in, in conversations. Uh, I'm seeing it be a lot easier uh, to divide and to and to you know, develop your own little way of communicating without involving other people. Uh, and I think this is on the rise. Uh, I worry about it. I worry about it a lot. Uh, you know, my primary fear right now is that we've lost, we've lost our filters, that it's just so easy for people to, to set up their own little groups and listen to themselves uh, and pretend that the only thing that they have to say is of any importance at all. Uh, and I, I do worry about that, and I think that 
we kind of fool ourselves by thinking that Vermont's a special little place. Uh, I mean, I think that we're special, but I think there's a lot to fear and a lot to work against. Thank you, Emerson. Deb Markowitz brings a view from a perspective from the political world, a uh, longtime Secretary of State, one time candidate for governor, and now Secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources. Deb. Well, it's, it's hard to be the last speaker, and, uh, but it's also good because I got to hear everybody's uh, different perspective. And, and um, I, too, like Emerson, um, see how uh, Vermont is somewhat different from other places, like many people on the panel talked about. Um, we're small enough that we can't objectify the other the way you can do in a larger place. We know the other. Right, there are neighbors, we go to town meeting, we see them at farmer's market. So it's hard to say a person who believes that is evil. Even more so, um, we know that if we're driving home and we get stuck on the side of the road, we might need them to pull us out of the ditch. Um, we still have this culture of mutuality in Vermont that I'm not sure we're gonna lose because of our size. But that being said, um, I'm also deeply concerned. And um, I'm seeing this I, I saw this as Secretary of State. I'm seeing this just as much at, as the Secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources. And as a parent of teenagers, I'm seeing this a lot. And that's, and that's that we used to have an, arbit, an arbiter of facts, um, and that was the press. Right, the press would put out information. It was uh, there. There was a, a strong ethical standard that members of the press followed, so that when you read things, you uh, you were getting facts and you could come to your own conclusion. And then you had guys like Emerson who could editorialize. But that's where the editorializing happened, and you knew that. And now what we're seeing um, in Vermont, as well as everywhere else, is people get their facts from sources. Um, that have it, that are really editorial sources, and that uh, we tend to, um, uh, and it's across the aisle. We tend to go back to those sources to confirm our beliefs or our values, and so we're creating parochialism in in the um, in the marketplace of ideas, which is of course the foundation of democracy. It's the idea is that you've got this wide open marketplace of ideas, and then you have a very impassioned debate, and maybe you do get personal a little bit, and then you apologize later. And we've seen this through history, you know, as we track debates. But it's based on this idea that we have this rich conversation about ideas and at the end, we come out with compromise. Our sources of information now are, uh, are divided, and there isn't this arbiter of facts that help guide us, I don't believe. As we're learning, uh, as we're getting our news more and more from, uh, from online sources, um, we're, it's, it's even uh, going further. And if you've ever read the comment sections in our, uh, in our uh, mainstream press and their online versions, you'll see uh, there's a lack of civility. And part of it is because there's, no, there, there's anonymi anonymity. Um, so let's come back to this idea that in Vermont, what makes us special is there isn't an anonymity. When we go to town meeting, um, we might get impassioned, but we know at the end of the day, we're going to see this person at the post office. And so we've got to make it right because we're gonna see this person in, in school or a, on the soccer field watching kids. And so that lack of anonymity, the fact that we're in community together is our strength, but the way we're heading as a society is, is away from that. And so I'm, I am uh, deeply concerned about it. Well, we've gotten a lot of things that we can now talk about uh, based on those comments. Um, and I'm, I wanna sort of just jump around a little and and take a look at some areas of, uh, of Vermont. Paul, you work very closely in the legislature. Um, when we look and uh, we heard, um, we, and we all know about how Congress has changed from the days of uh, when Emerson worked there and also when Jim Jeffords was there, uh, as we know. Bob Stafford, George Aiken. Uh, George Aiken used to have breakfast every morning with the majority leader of the Senate, even though he was a Republican. So when we look at the Vermont legislature, uh, how would you evaluate civility in the Vermont legislature today and give us a little perspective of how it's changing? 
Well, uh, again, it, it, we're light years different, I think, from, from D.C. politics um, and, and from many other states, in part for some of the reasons that other panelists have mentioned. Um, but, and, and there is, uh, many of our, our races uh, continue to be competitive. There isn't, you know, what you see in Congress, for instance, the gerrymandered district so that uh, one party will rule that district, and, and that increases a a bitter partisanship, I think, uh, once once those uh, elected officials get to Washington to represent that district, for instance, that is much less uh, the case here. Um, and and uh, the the partisanship is 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 certainly less. Um, that's more true in the state senate, I think, uh, than than in the house, where occasionally you do still have partisan, uh, more partisan votes on uh, on particular issues. But I think that the um, uh, there is, uh, there are certainly difficult conversations, but I think, as I think about, for instance, the Senate, we had a lot of issues in front of the state Senate this year, um, and, and some of the more controversial ones came down not to a partisan divide, but, um, but even close votes that were more on the issue, the, uh, whether you call it a physician-assisted death or death with dignity, for instance, it's, a, it's an interesting example. This was not a, a Republican-Democratic uh, divide, but um, a passionate divide among people who held uh, strong personal beliefs about that. And, um, and that was a difficult debate and conversation, not one that my organization played any part in. Um, and, but I think some of it, you know, that really tested, I guess, the, the, the politics of Vermont and these, these personal and political relationships. Um, and you saw it get, in, at times, personal, at times uh, heated. Um, and eventually that was an issue that worked its way through, um, certainly not in a way that everybody was happy with, but in a way that I think most of those members of the, the House and the Senate could, uh, uh, could look each other in the eye uh, uh, at the end of that and, and believe that they had an opportunity to be heard um, and, uh, and there was no foregone conclusion about what was going to happen there, which is a, which is a, a beautiful thing about our state politics, is that people have an opportunity to prevail uh, in large measure based on the merits of their ideas. And as long as that's true, I, it gives me, you know, greater faith in the, in the process here. Okay. I'm going to jump around and, and hit a couple of these topics, and then we'll let other panelists weigh in. Emerson, the news media. Uh, Deb has raised some questions about um, how the news media is fracturing in a way. And, and uh, also, um, if you look nationally, certainly, People will say that our news media is to blame for a lot of the uh, incivility nationally. And what they are talking about there, of course, is some of the TV networks. Um, but also, as Deb mentioned, the ability to be, to comment in an anonymous fashion. So I, when I look at Vermont and look at news sites, um, VT Digger requires you to say your name. And when you comment, and those tend to be very thoughtful comments. WCAX does not. You can use any handle that you want. And uh, if you looked in the last week about uh, on the stories of Governor Shumlin and the land deal, uh, a lot of people said he was scum and, and all of these other things that you would not say, I think, if your name was attached. So that's a lot for you. But what is the role of the news media here? Well, you know, basically, Chris, we've always been the problem. You know, uh, you know I mean, just dealing with the world as I can deal with it uh, and the organization. You put the I microphone run. closer to you. There. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, we've got a, a number of newspapers that, that we operate in Vermont. Uh, and generally speaking, no, I, categorically, uh, I don't allow anonymous uh, comments. Uh, I don't have, I don't even have. A, a chat section uh, on the, the website. Uh, we looked at that and saw it for what it was. Uh, you know, if, if people are going to comment, as far as I'm concerned, they need to comment thoughtfully uh, and respectfully. And that's just how I want to control uh, the news that comes out of my organization. And it's also, you know, what I consider to be a thoughtful uh, civil debate, period, uh, just end of sentence. And I think that that's a responsibility that uh, should be exercised more. And I think actually a lot of newspapers are figuring this out uh, because when you go through anonymous uh, chat lines, they do not add to the conversation whatsoever. 
uh, and I just think that's almost universally true. Uh, you know, I, in terms of uh, the press in, in general, and let's talk specifically about uh, Vermont, you know, the, you know, Chris, obviously you know better than anybody, uh, you know, start with the Associated Press report uh, in Montpelier. Uh, I mean, the AP report in Montpelier isn't anything like it used to be uh, 15 years ago. I mean, it's not half the, it doesn't have half the strength or the depth. Uh, you know, you've got a, a weakened condition in Vermont, uh, as in many countries or states, where the report just isn't as sound as it, as it used to be, uh, and in my, in my perspective, needs to be. And I worry about this an awful lot, uh, simply because I think it's, you know, the, not only the responsibility of the press to educate in terms of really, you know, being as thorough as they can uh, in analyzing the news and its impacts, uh, but it, if you don't have that, then you really lose the ability to have the civil conversation. And I'll give you, an, I'll just give you an example. In talking to the governor's office, uh, you know, I've offered a number of suggestions to them in terms of how they can improve their communication with the general public. And the response to that is, is that they don't dare in many instances because they're terrified of putting information out that can be torn apart by the public. And it's just there's no upside. So you know, you say, you know, why doesn't the governor do more, just as an example, more, uh, you know, op-eds, it's my turn. And the response is, if we do that, then the blogs, the online uh, chatter groups, tear them apart. They said it's just, it's an absolutely vicious environment out there. Um, so, you know, that hurts. You know, how do you have a civil conversation uh, if you don't understand the topics to begin with? I mean, it, this is all about information. It's all about having the right information. We can agree and to disagree on, on intent, but, you know, what's paralyzing is the whole thought that you have people out there who don't get the information, that they're denied that because they're terrified of one part of our society. And, you know, to Mr. Leach's point, a very, very small percentage of the Vermont public is dominating the, dominating the debate. You know, why do we allow this? But at the same time, you know, how do you fight back? And, you know, that's my responsibility in, 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 as far as I can extend uh, in terms of being as thorough as I can in, in the community report and through my editorial writing to be as objective as I can and open to other people's uh, conversation. It's just not happening enough. Paul Costello, your organization does many things, but one of the things it does is it's called in by communities to help bridge division. Um, what is your experience there? Uh, obviously, you're brought in because there are problems. Almost your organization sometimes is a mediator. How are you, how are you uh, uh, what is the response when you go into a community? Thanks, Chris. Uh, not just because the community has problems that they want to solve, but because they have a million ideas and they don't know how to line up around objectives that they can actually make progress on and build momentum around. We've done this all around the state. A, 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 a amazing occasion in Chelsea, two years after the Zantoff murders, we had a crowd almost this big in the town hall, and a 14-year-old boy stood up and he said, when I come into the lunchroom, I know just where to sit. The rich kids are over here. The poor kids are in this corner. The kids who've only been here three years are grouped over there. The hippies are there, and the rednecks are there. And I don't talk to you because my dad doesn't talk to your dad. Uh, I agree with Emerson that while we value this civility and we value this community as central to who we are as a people, it's endangered. Uh, in Johnson, where we did this process, they say, you know, we, we love the idea of ourselves as a community, but we have many communities within our community and they don't intersect. We have the college community, we have the downtown association, we have the arts crowd, we have the American Legion, we have the PTO and PTA. Everyone keeps a separate calendar, everyone has a separate invitation list, and when they invite, they invite their people and no one else feels invited. It's, it's separate. 
you know, the Council on the Future of Vermont that we managed, which was the, we believe, maybe the largest scale analysis of public values in the history of the state. We talked to thousands of people, jail, from kids in jail to GBIC. And fundamental to that conversation was the sense that Vermonters want to preserve and are, want to rededicate to strong community with all the civic and civil values that we're talking about here, but they fear to Vermont's, the separation of rich and poor. The rich are getting richer in this world and the poor are getting poorer, and we don't bump elbows as much as we used to. We don't have to. We can go on online communities of interest where people think the way we do and reinforce our internal prejudices for good and for bad, and we can uh, live a life from our car to wherever we're going and back in our travels and not necessarily depend on our neighbors or interchange with our neighbors as equals in the way that people were forced to do with their geographical community in the past. And, and I think, you know, one of the fundamental findings of the Council on the Future of Vermont is that we're not happy with that. We're not content with it. We're not, it, it's a violation of some of our deepest held values as a people. And so, you know, I'll come back to this, but it, it's all about for me, civility is not just about, pub about politeness and public discourse. It's about a, a deep and intentional process of mutual invitation to society and to, uh, to uh, civic dialogue. Thank you. Deb, I want your perspective on uh, the political sphere. And um, I wonder if maybe a starting point might be your current position. The Secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources that is a flashpoint agency about people's property rights, about development, uh, about just things that hit home for people. Um, can you give us a sense of whether you think that, is, that process uh, you're seeing in those debates, uh, civility or incivility? Um, well, that's a good question. I hadn't thought you'd be asking f from that role, so let me, let me frame it. Um, there, in the Agency of Natural Resources, we do a variety of things, but what, what Chris is really talking about is the regulatory arm of the organization. And that's um, where science, law, and policy meet, right? Ba you know, our scientists will uh, take a look at a piece of property, uh, they'll make a determination based on um, the, the particular landscape and say, uh, this is how it's going to apply to a permit. You know, do you get the permit or do you not? Well, they're first deciding, is it a wetland? And then if it's a wetland, we've got public policy that comes in to say, here are the rules around what you can and can't do with wetlands. And where I see a lack of civility is um, there is a segment of the population that, um, that will uh, personalize it. And so they'll, they'll actually attack my staff who are just, you know, lifetime civil servants who are doing what they're passionate about, but they're, uh, you know, objectively or are trying to be objective in applying science to, uh, to the law and the policies we have that they had nothing to do with creating. And so a lot of my role as secretary is running interference on that I mean, to protect those employees from an uncivil response. I would say in the vast majority of cases, though, that's not so. Um, nowhere more, uh, though, has this happened than in the wind debate. Um, what I've found is that people feel so passionately about their perspective on, uh, on um, ridgetop wind that the attacks on my staff have been very vicious and personal and, uh, and in my view, inappropriate. So I've had to step in and I see my role as the, the political person as the, the place where that ought to be directed because I'm the one who gets to influence policy, which is really where the debate lies. Uh, let me just step, putting on my other hat as, you know, former Secretary of State, one of my big focuses and passions was civic education in our schools. And um, I spent a lot of my own personal energy uh, focused on trying to re-educate our kids on what it is to be a part of a democracy. And I see this reflected in the debates in the legislature and the debates around, around Ridgetop Wind that that um, there's a lack of appreciation for that foundational principle of compromise. 
compromise is seen as um, as uh, violation, violating um, your your values. You know, it's like giving it's being a bad person to compromise, and. Truly, the foundation of this democracy is compromise, right? And well, the idea is that we get people who bring their life experience to the table to debate an issue, an issue that's an obviously not an easy issue because there are people on every side. And through that pa impassioned debate, you come out with a compromise position that hopefully, in a democracy, will work for most of the people, work well for most of the people, or all of the people. And of course, we also have some protections for minority interests um, as, as part of this. And um, what has happened, in part because of this division of where we get our information and, and how we're all talking to ourselves, is that there isn't an appreciation of differences of opinion and there isn't a respect. It's easy to objectify the other. And I've seen that in the wind debate, that we're objectified as evil in the hands of big corporate wind or whatever it is, and as opposed to scientists and policymakers who simply have a different opinion on what the science tells us, uh, what's good policy, um, and how the law applies in a particular case. So I think we need we we must do more education, especially since now you never have to hear the perspective of the other side or the multiple other sides. You can get your news sources, you can go to the blogs, you get your inform. You know, I I look at Huffington Post every day um, because they tell because it's fun. They're saying what I want to hear, right? Um, but I also go to lots of other places. I've got a daughter who only goes to the Huffington Post. She's not even aware of the other places to go to. Okay. So Paul, we'd look to you for a little uh, historical context here um, because standards change over time and we always refer to something as a golden age or something as the worst time ever. Uh, I think uh, to Matthew Lyon, jailed uh, for um, spitting on a congressman, a congressman from Connecticut, uh, calling President Adams uh, his rotundity, uh, which was a huge, huge um, profanity of the time. So when you think about Vermont and you think about where we are today, are thing, how do things relate? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think First of all, the impression that there was a golden age is probably untrue. Um, and I, as, as you say, I often will remind us all that there were worse elections, that worse things were said about people, that people were more divided in this state than they are today, really, in spite of our little fights that we have. I, I was reading about the little museum they'd set up in the Democratic paper in Montpelier where they had a a display of all the things that had been thrown through the window during the Civil War. And the number of times that people have been threatened with, you know, physical violence over the years because of the problems that they've had. I don't think we're any, I, I don't know that we've, we're, we're better necessarily than they are, but we're, we are more civil. But civil sometimes masks a, a kind of a face that uh, doesn't, necessarily mean that you're listening to somebody or that you're r willing to respond and I think you, you can choose to use understatement as a more vicious uh, uh, a tool than maybe being outright about it. Uh, when we, you know, I think that listening to uh, Deb in particular and some of the others here that one of the difficulties with an era in which the institutions and the traditions have been dissolving in front of our eyes is that we've been losing the opportunity to have uh, a, a forum, and I said town meeting, but I could also say the courts or the legislature or, or uh, any se session in which you have a moderator, in which you have somebody who's in charge who can bring the debate out, who can, who can play it like a symphony in a way. And, and unfortunately, with the press's demise or, or, or devolution and the loss of a standard point of view, we haven't got anyone to moderate the division in, in, in the divisions that are there. And, and as a result, we're left with the last speaker standing as being the last word or, or that it's such a jumble. There's no opportunity for organization and discipline. Um, but history doesn't give us uh, much comfort. It should uh, actually remind us that we're a little bit better. At least, at least we dress better and we speak better than we did in the past. 
So Jeff, I look to you for some perspective on the law and, uh, and what might be the role of the courts or whether the role of the courts is changing here. Um, the Westboro uh, Baptist Church case uh, in 2011 where Chief Justice Roberts wrote, as a nation we have chosen a different course to protect even hurtful speech on public issues to ensure that we do not stifle public debate. Let me take that from just a slightly different perspective. I, I think one of the, and, and, and just to echo uh, what Paul Gillies just said about that I'm li sort of living in the 19th century now as I'm studying a, a lawyer from Boston who uh, was active in the days of the fugitive slave law in 1850, uh, 1851, when every single, I'm talking about from justices on the Supreme Court to uh, Daniel Webster, the most powerful person, Secretary of State, most powerful person in the country, to, uh, as Emerson said, bankers, lawyers, men of fashion, all supported the fugitive slave law. And if you were against this fugitive slave law, you had a fair uh, chance of being charged with treason. Uh, and this was at a point in time where uh, you had a very polite society, the Brahmin society, almost universally in favor of a um, enormously draconian uh, Draconian law, and if you look to the media or the newspapers at the time to sort of, as as arbitrators of that, or where you'd get your objective information, it would it'd be virtually impossible to do that. Uh, going back and looking at newspapers, the, every single newspaper paper was a was a partisan newspaper. So you're pulling out. If I pull out a quote from the New York Times in, 19, in 1851, it doesn't really tell you a lot about what the object was because they had a point of view as did it, as did uh, the papers at the time. It, it seems to me that one of the lessons, or I would hope that one of the lessons of uh, a constitutional democracy, and particularly when you th think of the role of courts, is that we don't ex that we ought not to expect. Or we ought, one ought to be concerned about looking to courts for final answers. And it seems to me uh, that courts act best when they prompt uh, constitute debate, when they infuse. Uh, debates with constitutional principles, but you don't want courts precluding uh, the democratic process. And Jim Leach mentioned two of the two, the two, two decisions he mentioned. The Dred Scott case, of course, that was a, that's an instance where the Supreme Court, you know, working from the best of motives as they saw it, took an issue that could have been decided on a very narrow ground and tried to solve all the issues uh, that related to the, the run-up to the Civil War and, and in fact, uh, contributed to it. And in the same sense, I think one can say that the, the Citizens United case reflects a certain view of politics in which uh, the court is trying to settle once and for all um, what, that, what that might be. And, and I guess one thing I would just say in terms of your, as you look to courts, it, it always depends on where you're sitting, right? When, when in the same-sex marriage case, for example, now in front of the United States Supreme Court, uh, those, if, if you thought the court was gonna come out in favor of same-sex marriage, you'd have one perspective. If, as I think is the more realistic view, it's a court that's likely to be opposed uh, to it. You, you don't want them taking a uh, global view to all the issues and settling it once and for all. And I think that makes sense in a, in a, in a democracy in which particularly with moral issues, you want to see the debate continue. Um, and you want the court to act as a, um, as, as if, not, if not an umpire in those situations, as setting the context of the parameters for the debate to say, you know, we are talking about uh, issues of equality and, consti and, and constitutional principles. And I think that is a, is a contribution that um, is a much, is one that, it's equual to and, and, and in some sense is greater than uh, this sort of idea that, um, that is endemic in our society. We'll take it to the court and they will give us a final answer. I think that's a, that's a view that um, uh, distorts rather than contributes to uh, civility and constitutional democracy. Because if you foreclose a debate through a constitutional, uh, uh, through an opinion of the Supreme Court, uh, that can, as we've seen in our history, um, uh, the Civil War being the best example, uh, foreclose it entirely. I mean, the, the famous, uh, when Stephen Douglas, the Vermonter, right, from Brandon, Brandon criticized in the Lincoln-Douglas debate said, uh, 
uh, about the Dred Scott decision, uh, Douglas said to Lincoln, I've never heard of a decision being appealed from the Supreme, United States Supreme Court. And Lincoln said, of course it can be appealed. It can be appealed to the country. And that's, um, I think, what one ought to keep in mind as you look to the balance here of uh, what institutions can do and what they can't do to um, make the process work. Thank you. So what I'm going to do now is uh, you can see two microphones, or you can't really see the microphones, but you can see the microphone stands. And I'm going to invite people to line up at those. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Jim Leach if he would come join us up here as well uh, in this chair um, and see if what uh, people would like to see discussed by this panel and our guest. So. Uh, um, as, as you think of your questions and as you take your position there, I'm going to just ask this group in really just sort of a minute, if you could, as people get organized there. Um, we've heard everybody talk about different things, and I sort of went to areas of expertise. So I'm sure this group, you all have thoughts on something else you've heard. So starting uh, with Paul, um, uh, Paul Burns. Just any comments you might have on something you heard uh, or want to add to this debate? Just, I, I think that one of my greatest concerns when we think about uh, incivility in Vermont is something Secretary Markowitz uh, mentioned uh, around a particular issue, wind for instance, and it could be uh, others as well, but that is one where there is a, um, a lack of civility which moves dangerously close to intimidation, uh, it seems to me, that might prevent, uh, in this case, public servants from doing their job. Uh, and it has an impact on legislators uh, and, and possibly the administration as well. Um, and even more troubling, it has an impact on citizens in communities that might prevent them from speaking out, whether it be at town meeting or at uh, meetings uh, uh, scheduled to discuss a particular idea or proposal. And I've heard from a number of people that uh, that is a fear of being uh, at least ostracized, if not something more ominous than that, that might prevent them from, from speaking out. And, and that, to me, is uh, one of the most dangerous uh, and unfortunate things that I've seen. Emerson. You know, usually when you go to, to a conference like this, one of the uh, objectives uh, is you always like to leave with at least, you know, a single thought in place, you know, what, that makes the, the day's conversation worthwhile. Uh, and for me, I, you know, I was particularly struck by a comment that Paul made uh, earlier in terms of uh, really articulating the desire of most people to find uh, that common ground, to, to, you know, the art of compromise, but also just wanting to be part of the process and often uh, not being, uh, and the failure really to figure out how we get from here to there. Uh, and I think that that's one of the questions that we that needs to, as we leave today, uh, that we need to think an awful lot about is that, okay, you know, we recognize what's going on, we understand the disparities, we understand the disconnections, but what makes it work? You know, what do we need to do? Uh, because otherwise, you know, all we're doing here today is preaching to the choir. Uh, everybody in this room basically is of the same mind, uh, but, you know, what are the next steps? What do we do? Uh, I, I want to reflect partly on the political issue in the legislature where I think that the press actually did a, a really good job at uh, unveiling what was perceived as uh, uncivil dialogue. There was a lot of uh, interrogatory style in the legislature last year and a, a certain, you know, in perceived arrogance in some uh, the way people were working and not working together. And I think people were called on it, and Vermonters weren't satisfied with it. So I think that that was uh, an important step, and it, it was a correction. So we're, we are aware as a people, and there is a response. Um, another thing I just want to mention on that, the, the role of the Internet. We're running eVermont and the Digital Economy Project at VCRD, and one of our partners is Front Porch Forum, where they have moderated community dialogues. With federal support, we're bringing them to every town in the state. And as you look at the breakdown that the internet <coughs> produces with these vertical communities of like-minded people, we're building horizontal communities 
of the local people. They can have a potluck dinner too, you know. <laughs> so we need to think about that and the vehicles that we have available with this creative new media to go another mile in terms of learning more about each other and sharing across categories. So there's, there's grounds for optimism in some of this too. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll speak to some comments that Paul made in talking about his community visits. And there's two, two uh, points I want to make. And one is that um, in my role as Secretary of State, I t talk a lot about the importance of town meeting. And I don't remember now who said it, but somebody in the audience who was uh, critical of floor meetings said, really, that's just democracy for the extroverted, <laughs> right? Because who's willing to come up and talk and participate? It's, you know, it's not everybody. Um, the value, though, of town meeting is it crosses all of those lines, all of the groups come to one place, and even though maybe not everyone stands up to speak, and if there's a good moderator, maybe more come out to speak, but, but even so, it's an opportunity for a socializing that, that uh, crosses over the sub-communities in a community. And this is why that is so important, and this is why civ the reason why civility is so important, and really cultivating Vermont's culture of civility, this ability to to really be neighbors with one another, is um, you know my world right now is all about the uncertainties we face from climate change, right? You know we see these these uh, weather events, we see more and more. We had you know Irene, we had the the big flood uh, of Lake Champlain, we've just had another uh, big flood that took out roads in a more localized area. And one of the things I've learned in studying what makes a community resilient, um, the most important factor as to whether or not a community is going to bounce back isn't how much money, how rich it is. It's the richness of civic engagement. The ability of across these different divides in a community to come together and work together towards common purpose and to take care of each other, a mutuality uh, that comes without quid pro quo. You know, the idea that, that we are generous to one another, that we bring a casserole, even though we don't expect to get a casserole back in return when we have a neighbor who's lost a child or is undergoing cancer treatment. And um, that we cannot lose its importance. So this debate goes beyond what happens in the legislature. I believe it, it uh, really stands to whether or not we're going to thrive as a state in light of the uncertainties in, in the next decades. Uh, as a lawyer, I'm spending more and more of my time in mediation. In mediation, we separate the parties. We don't let them look at each other. We don't ex accept that they would be having to confront each other. And a mediator goes back and forth and usually resolves it as if there was no opportunity for debate. In the legislature, we have you know, debate, 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 we have a vote. But in most of the things that count in this country, we don't seem to be able to reach any conclusions because there's no end to it. Abortion, campaign finance, name the issue. We're still talking about it. And as we get older and older and get more and more exhausted saying the same things over and over again, I think it's inevitable we're going to be frustrated. <laughs> Spoken like somebody who's a century old. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make a comment. Somebody talked about the, uh, the lack of intermediaries, uh, intermediaries now in society. And I just want to make a comment that may resonate with the lawyers here. And I saw Judge Crawford. Um, this is a process, that, uh, a phenomenon that continues in Vermont and elsewhere in the country. That is uh, people representing themselves pro se uh, acting without lawyers in court, particularly in family cases. And one of the, one of the losses in that, uh, is, it seems to me, is that when you're not represented by counsel, uh, sometimes you lack the intermediary to explain a decision that otherwise looks personal. I mean, a, a lawyer who uh, has represented many people in court, who can talk about uh, a judge's decision uh, and help a client work through that, um, serves a, a function that I think is lost now uh, when you have the pro se, um, you have the pro se litigants. Uh, someone s said that for civility in public discourse, you need constancy and private affection. And I think there's a certain amount of, uh, you know, as you look to societal breakdown, the lack of constancy and private affection um, seen sometimes in these bitter 
pro se debates over uh, family dysfunction then spills over into our public forums. And Jim, I'll invite you. Uh, you've been listening to this panel. Before we go to questions, any comments or reflections on what you've heard here about Vermont or about this conversation? Well, the, as the outsider in this group, I, I would say it, it's very, very hard not to be extraordinarily respectful of this state. Uh, and it's very interesting to me uh, a, a comment just made that you have this long tradition of, of town meetings. Uh, the, the, I mean, you are the heart of it. Uh, but the comment that there's something new occurring with the Internet, which is also uh, can be a town meeting oriented, although perhaps of people that have, are a little more opinionating than the average. Uh, I would only comment that we have a breakdown in American society where at the lower levels of governance, at a community level, then the state level, and the federal level, the federal level is where the biggest problem is. Uh, now some of the aspects of federal politics are spinning downwards. Uh, but one of the reasons for it is when you think about a town meeting, uh, no one that walks into a town meeting is worried that the next person has been influenced by money. There's no, the money is the elephant at the door in Washington. Uh, that, and if you talk about uh, a comment was just made about campaign reform, and I frankly written more campaign reform laws than most, none of which have succeeded, by the way. Uh, but uh, the Citizen United re ruling makes them, at least at the national level, virtually irrelevant because you can define a campaign reform approach, but it can never stop corporate giving. And so the elephant at the door is money. And so one of the great challenges for American society is, uh, to me, related precisely to human nature, how it is that one deals with the money issue, and the great challenge is to get as much out of the political process as possible that's reasonable, and to go to a model like Vermont uh, that I uh, look at with enormous, enormous respect. Thank you. Okay, let's start with your question, please. I, I just want to agree with Deb Markowitz on education. I think education is really important, and I think that it should begin in the earliest age, uh, stages of schooling. And I'm thinking of the Dalai Lama and Thich Nhat Hanh, who uh, talk about compassion, and uh, it's not just compassion. Compassion meaning that you you care about your fellow human being, and with that you. Uh, have respect, you're, you're honest, you're, and, and you take your responsibility into account. Um, and I say the education should start at the early ed earliest ages because that's where you would learn to communicate uh, using uh, mindfulness techniques. And I was really surprised, I was in Winooski some weeks ago and I was talking to a child who'd gotten in a disagreement with another child and he, he said, he was telling me about it, and then he used the word, I was mindful, and I was so stunned that I didn't listen to the rest of his story. <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, I think this, I was really impressed. I mean, this is happening in Winooski at the grade school there. And I, that's why I think that education isn't just, you know, your academics. It's, it's this human aspect that we need to be teaching because that teaches you to communicate in a way uh, where you uh, criticize or listen constructively rather than using uh, words like scum you might use the word uh, unethical or unfair something like that and so I just yeah I think that we need to have besides the academics something much deeper in our public schools okay any comments from the panel question uh, I have a laundry list of questions and I'll try to uh, be succinct in this but I wonder, is civility really the right focus for this conversation? Uh, the word intransigence came up, and people's uh, deep-rooted beliefs and how difficult those can be to deal with in the present political environment. And uh, civility, you know, I think of political humor, which can be incredibly biting, 
and uh, uh, nasty in some cases. And we wouldn't want to cut that off, I don't think. It can be very insightful mm -hmm. and bring a lot of uh, illumination to issues. So we get to the question of why people seem more um, unwilling to move from a position. And I wonder what uh, role you might think fear has to do with that when we're in a country that has become much larger than our founders ever could have imagined, have we reached a point where the personal involvement and the ability to have an impact seems so watered down that people fear uh, their, their loss of control, their loss of influence? And we still have that in Vermont because of the scale of the state and the town meetings. So is that something that you think might play a role? And if it does, how can we bring that kind of meaning back to people in their communities? Thank you. Who'd like to comment? Deb? That was a really, um, I think, provocative idea is that fear, and there's a lot of talk about the role of fear in, in political campaigns. Um, I actually think that uh, what's happened, though, when we think na when we look nationally um, at uh, election statistics and how many people are turning out and who's turning out, is um, it, what happens in Washington feels really far away and, frankly, irrelevant. And so, I think for most people in their lives, they don't understand how what's happening in Washington and those debates in Congress, how it affects their real lives, and they're involved in their real lives. You know, they're, we've got you know families where both parents are working. If there are two parents, and there's uh, often lengthy commutes to work. There's uh, lots of demands now. Children have a million activities that they've got to get to, and so I, I think um, mundane life takes over, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think that's probably true across history. You know, in the time of Genghis Khan, the people who were paying attention were not the average person trying to eke out a living. Um, so I think the challenge for us is how do we, um, how do we help people understand where they can matter? And when we saw this last presidential election, um, we saw the rise of particularly the Hispanic voters because they made the link between what happens in Congress and something that they very much care about. And so in unprecedented numbers, this group that formerly really didn't vote a lot came out and voted. We saw that with the election of Barack, Barack Obama, where African Americans came out in huge numbers for, for the first time and remarkably, again, for the second term. And, uh, and that's because they saw how what was happening in this national election was going to matter to them. So to the extent that we can draw back that connection to people, I think um, that's the way we're going to re-engage voters. Paul Costello. Has anyone noticed there's a lot of zombie movies? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and the, the, the back rhetoric on climate change is global destruction, and uh, that there's an apocalyptic mentality that's behind a lot of thinking that doesn't come to the surface lots of time. Uh, Robert J. Lifton, the psychohistorian, you know, whatever that is, talks about psychohistorical discontinuity when you face things like that and you, you have to back off from them. Um, I'm just back from Indianapolis where I met with uh, rural state leaders from across the country, including this gal from western Kansas who runs a ranch on the Oglala Aquifer and the water's drying up under her ranch and her neighbors are all of being deeply affected. And there's been a movement within the legislature of Kansas to make it illegal to use the word sustainable in state statute. Because this sense of threat is, is deeply com uh, connected to people's connection to the land, their love of the land, their love of their own property, their sense of the future. And she says that the world has become so black and white that her neighbors believe that they need to develop their land and do what they want, and some of them are building 10,000 cow dairies, uh, <laughs> you know, with, uh, without water for the future. And they're doing so because they believe that it's <coughs> their job to be fruitful and multiply, and God will provide, providence will take care of 100 years from now. That's not their job. So the idea of sustainability has become antithetical. And she says, 
you can't talk about it with your neighbors. You can't talk about evolution in my neighborhood. And th this is an educated person who's in, got educated people around her. That's, that's really frightening. And, it's, uh, and, and, it, and we're not there yet in Vermont. We're, we're able to have this conversation. But there are people who say, don't have a conference on climate change. We can't talk about that. You're only going to divide people. And I, I, I believe we have to get over that, and we have to have hard conversations and be ready to disagree, but work our ways forward together. Emerson? Uh, and then Paul. It, it, particularly since I'm from Kansas. Uh, <laughs> 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 right. And uh, you know, I ran the political campaign for Nancy Landon Kassebaum, and at that time, uh, Kansas was, it hasn't really changed too much, Kansas is a state where a man's a man and a woman is a cook, his cook. <laughs> so that's what I dealt with at, at those times. It hasn't changed too much. As a matter of fact, I think it's probably gotten worse. Uh, to your comment, though, about uh, fear, uh, one of the things that, that I was taught from an early age, uh, the first senator that I worked for, he looked at me and says, you know, in governing, the person who governs best is the person who governs with 51% of the power. And I, you know, I never really understood that until you, you really thought about it for a while. Um, and what happens, and it's happening in Vermont right now, but the problem, when you have 51% of the vote, that means you need everybody to make a decision because you don't really have enough all by yourself. So you're always depending, because you're going to have defections within your own party, you're always going to depend on other people to get things done. And you know, I think that was an incredibly wise uh, thing for him to observe and to pass on. Uh, but in, in terms of bringing the discussion to Vermont and fear, we don't have 51%. You know, there's, there's, I don't think the balance that we need in Vermont. Uh, and I think that when you get when you get to the political powers that you've got, I think it's very difficult for them because, you know, they want, they don't understand 51%. They've got 65% and they've got 70% and that, they like that. Who wouldn't like that? And you have to understand that, you know, that's what politics is, is survival at one level or the other. And it's not just the politics of your elected leaders, but also your political organizations. They're not in this to lose. They're in it to win. Now, take a look at Washington, D.C. You know, when I was there, this did not exist. But today, seven out of the ten richest counties in America surround Washington, D.C. And if that doesn't tell you all you need to know, I don't know what does. Uh, Paul Gillis. I just wanted to respond to that issue about fear and intransigence. I think, you know, uh, it's not a, a unique idea that uh, with the great uh, smorgasbord of ideas and issues that are out there that none of us can handle any, all of it together. And so what we do is, in order to handle the depressing fear that we're, we're not engaged, we pick a subject and we make it our issue. And then we pick that subject and we take one side of that issue and we hold on to it as if there is that that's the, our control, uh, that's our, our, our hinge on reality. And it, it may be that the issues are so complex and there are so many different issues that we can't have a dialogue with everybody about anything because we're all so divided. He wants to uh, lead us off and, and part of that comes down to, I also think, um, that some say that uh, in society today we are, rec we are rewarding people uh, who say that type of language. You know, you have the screaming TV panels on uh, the cable stations, you have the reality shows now where every other word's bleeped out, uh, that w we have uh, changed what we consider uh, civil and uns uncivil behavior in that way. Who'd like to start? Deb, you're in the political world. Uh, well, I, I think about this um, regularly. Um, let's think back to the campaign, um, Peter Welch's first campaign, um, when uh, he ran, uh, the, 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 he and his opponent, uh, who was uh, the head of the National Guard, a uh, really bright young woman, 
um, a moderate Republican, made a decision, they made a pact to run a positive campaign, that they would use no negative campaigning, and they would object to anybody doing that on their behalf. So when the Democratic Congressional Committee wanted to run uh, an attack ad on Martha Rainville about this or that, uh, Peter Welch said no. And, uh, and then the same thing um, on Martha's side. When the Republicans came, they were very mad at her. They wanted to run attack ads on Peter Welch. They felt he was vulnerable because he was a trial attorney. No offense to the attorneys in the room. And, um, and she said no. It was a very civil campaign. And if you notice, Peter Welch was not on Deb Bucknam's list of quotes. He's been incredibly effective in Congress because when he came to Congress, it was not in the context of that kind of extreme political divide. And, uh, and he's a, a, a congressman, a House member, who can cross the aisle and work across the aisle towards common purpose. One of the few. There's not very many in that huge body. And I actually believe it's because he came out of that campaign um, without having to participate in that extreme rhetoric. Um, I hear Bernie's rhetoric, I hear uh, Pat Leahy's rhetoric, and it's part of the changed Congress. It's part of what you see in the U.S. Senate. Um, Howard Dean is playing uni a unique role. He is a partisan. He is one of those folks in those talk shows where you've got the two, uh, the two uh, colorful entertainers talking about politics. And so that's certainly, uh, and certainly as chair of the Democratic Party the, at the most partisan, that was in part his job was to inflame the passions of the folks who uh, believe, uh, share, share the belief. Um, I think that's part of the debate right now. That's part of this, why this conversation is so important, is um, that is successful. That's the way um, the game of politics is played today. And what's it going to take to change it? Um, that's, you know, when, when we're talking about Vermont politics and we've got negative campaigns, there was some really terrible ads in this last election. Um, you know, Vermonters uh, in, in the political leaders uh, s did stand up to talk about it when, uh, but not right away. You know, the first, the first negative campaigns that I saw in politics, um, well, there was a tax on Bernie Sanders always. Uh, there was one notable one where he was said to con consort with child molesters, um, which was not ultimately <laughs> successful because we all know Bernie Sanders and know that could not be true. But the first um, competitive race uh, where that national approach of negative ads played uh, as part of it was the open seat for governor between Jim Douglas and Doug Racine. And at that point, nobody, nobody stood up and said, hey, this is unacceptable. And the voters didn't stand up and say it's unacceptable. Um, and I think that's part of the problem. Jeff? I think the negative campaigning I issue goes to uh, part of the political culture that inflames these kinds of comments, obviously. Uh, among Jim Leach's uh, accomplishments is he was director of the Institute of Politics at the Kennedy School. And one of the purposes of the Institute of Politics at Kennedy School is to examine American political culture. It always, I don't know if it struck Jim the same way, but one thing that always struck me about is they spend a, the Kennedy School spends a disproportionate amount of time bringing in and acknowledging the most successful campaign strategists in the country, who always are interesting to hear from, but they're always successful for one reason. Uh, they're successful because they've, they've run extraordinarily uh, negative campaigns and it just seems to me that um, the incentive and what is acknowledged even at Harvard uh, helps distort helps distort the process um, Jim spoke earlier about uh, the, the duel between Burr and, and uh, Hamilton uh, I remember once when I was uh, Attorney General and I'd been accused uh, for a position I'd taken before the court of uh, giving aid and comfort to the enemy. Uh, and that was a, it was from a fairly well-known Vermonter who was always careful with his language. And I knew where he drew that from. That's part of the definition of treason. It's in the Constitution. So had we been in a dueling country, I would have challenged him immediately to a duel. And <laughs> sometimes I think that that, um, it didn't work out too well for, for Hamilton, but sometimes I think if you still had dueling, you know, you, that would 
diminish the uh, stridency of some of these uh, criticisms. <laughs> well, now you have your takeaway for today. <laughs> your question, please. So maybe this follows on the last one fairly well, but I guess I'm all in favor of civility, but what I'm interested in asking, and maybe I'd be very curious if Mr. Leach would like to at least comment on this, and that is when, if ever, can you justify incivility? I mean, in other words, you could take the Occupy movement, you could take those who are pro-life, pro-choice, whether it be deeply held religious beliefs or moral principles or whatever. Can you justify incivility, be it speech or conduct or whatever, and if so, when? So Jim, we'll start with you, and uh, Jeff has the microphone for you. Well, we've, we've had uh, uh, what we've come to respect a great deal of uh, uh, citizen uh, protest. I mean, whether it be uh, the civil rights movement, uh, whether it be uh, actually the, the Civil War. I mean, uh, the South, in a sense, had the cons part of the Constitution on its side, uh, but it had morality on the other side. Uh, and uh, uh, we've even had protests in America, oddly enough, that have uh, to support Supreme Court rulings. And for example, the, the, the famous uh, Freedom Riders of 1961 were a group of citizens who went to the South and their goal was to insist that a Supreme Court ruling be upheld and that you could have uh, public access to uh, uh, facilities that are, or access for minorities to public facilities. Uh, but there are times and places for uh, uh, civil disobedience, uh, but they're awfully rare uh, in a uh, a great democracy. Uh, now there also are moral issues and, and sometimes uh, uh, in my view they've become exaggerated. That is, uh, when I entered Congress I viewed virtually every issue as a judgmental issue and that you have a core set of values that are your own. Today you have a circumstance uh, if you consider something a moral issue and if I hold a moral stand uh, and the judge here has another position, by implication, I consider him immoral. Uh, and if that's true in one issue, it also ties into other issues. And so one of the things you have in, in legislative politics is a group of people that uh, uh, truly disrespect the other side. Uh, but uh, I, I've never known a society that has less reason to have cleavages of that nature. Uh, but more reason to have differences of judgment on almost any issue that come to, comes about. Any other comments on that? Okay, your question, please. Well, I had a question about uh, the First Amendment and campaign finance. I happen to be someone who believes the Supreme Court got it right in Citizens United that the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law concerning freedom of speech. It doesn't say anything about who the speakers are, whether they be people, corporations, whatever the source of the speech. The First Amendment was a restraint on Congress. And there have been a lot of efforts to enact various campaign finance laws, particularly here in Vermont. And one of the main focuses has been on reducing the amount that individuals can contribute directly to candidates. And in my view, and I'd like to hear your opinion on that, that just pushes the dollars that are going to be in campaigns out further away. It distances them from the candidates, and it allows those dollars to be spent in ways candidates may not like, or perhaps they do like but don't want to be held accountable for what various ads in support of them say. And I was just wondering, I'm someone who supports, frankly, unlimited contributions to candidates and full disclosure on the internet because I see that it, one of the ways that we can compete say with a George Soros, someone like me who doesn't have millions of dollars, is to band together with others and uh, contribute and s promote our issues on that way. And I did want to clarify one point about Citizens United. Citizens United does not 
allow uh, corporations to give money directly to candidates. Citizens United allows corporations to engage in what are called independent expenditures, which is uh, expenditures in support of candidates that do not, uh, that are not coordinated with them or, or coordinated with the candidates' campaigns. So I was just wondering what your thoughts were on, on this idea that as we've brought in more restrictions, people are finding other ways to bring in money to influence elections. And as it get, I think as it gets further and further away from the candidates directly, there's less accountability with regard to what is being said throughout the political process. Okay, thank you. Jim, do you want to start that one? Well, first, in your first point, uh, I've been in politics a long time. I've never known a corporate head that couldn't speak and be heard. And so there's a difference between speaking and putting out money. And the, to, for Citizens United to hang as a First Amendment issue, uh, it has to say that money is speech. And I have to ask you, is it? And then when you ask for about a corporation, you have to ask yourself, who is the corporation? Is it the shareholders? Is it the board of trustees? Is it the management? Is it the community in which the corporation exists? Uh, uh, is it the customer? But basically, corporations are hierarchical. Uh, and in, in our system of, 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 of corporate governance, and basically the, the uh, responsible party is often one person or at most a few. And so what Citizens United says is that a corporation is a hierarchical structure uh, that should be given extra power that you as an ordinary citizen do not have. And that is a very interesting dilemma for, for our society. Now on the issue of, of public funding, I mean, everybody can have different judgments and, and uh, I respect yours, but I will tell you how I used to parse it. I used to think that uh, one credible way is to have matching public funds to, to small contributions. Uh, and then put a limit on how high that match should be, and then put a limit or threshold that you have to raise a given amount in small contributions before you qualify. But that's a, an approach of me as an individual. Others are more have more extensive public financing. Others think public financing is all wrong. On this 501c4 circumstance, what you have is indirect public financing of elections for people of true wealth. And that's a very interesting phenomenon because what it says is you can give a tax exempt uh, amount of money to something labeled a nonprofit. The nonprofit can then use half of their resources to do exactly what Citizens United authorizes to do. Uh, and that to me uh, is a poor approach to take. Paul Burns. Uh, well, I, my organization, VPIRG, of course, works for campaign finance reform, and so we, we do disagree over this. Uh, but I think the legislature had it about right in 1997 when they passed strict limits on what uh, individuals uh, and any single entity could give to candidates uh, and actually put an absolute cap on what candidates could spend um, running for office as well. Uh, this was uh, intentionally provocative from a constitutional standpoint because it ran headlong into the court's 1976 decision, which essentially said that money equals speech, uh, and therefore you can't limit what a, what a candidate spends running for office. Um, that itself conflicts with what the American public, of course, believes or would like to see, which is that, that there should be a limit, um, that there is a reasonable place where, uh, where we can say, you know, beyond that, you aren't helping to um, uh, make clear your position, but are instead drowning out potentially your, your opponent. And, um, and so I think you know, when we, that, that law actually had limits of $200 for a state rep, $300 for a Senate candidate, and $400 for a statewide candidate. Now giving $400 to a candidate running for office is far more than most Vermonters could ever imagine giving, but it's not beyond the pale. Um, uh, perhaps. And, uh, and now, of course, we're talking about limits that far exceed that. Um, and uh, since the court struck down Vermont's law in 2006, 
we haven't been able to get a new law put in place in the Vermont legislature. And we've come very close a few times, including this, this last session. But it's quite incredible that we can't reestablish what are common sense limits uh, on what, what we can give to candidates. Um, and this time, uh, the legislature even considered putting a cap on what individuals or corporations could give to these independent political action committees, also known as the super PACs. Uh, no state has yet uh, tried that, and um, there is a political, there is a legal argument about how you might be able to get away with it. Um, but that's a that's that's what the legislature is grappling with now, and and uh, believe it or not, they will come back in January and see if uh, they can uh, work out the differences between a House and Senate uh, proposal to uh, to do something about these limits. Jeff, I guess the speaker reminded me of uh, with her articulate and passionate view I, of. Uh, my friend Justice Burgess on the Vermont Supreme Court who has exactly her perspective. And when I get in debates with him, I quickly retreat from the legal analysis to uh, my own political experience. And so let me talk about that a little bit. But just uh, at least in terms of perspective, it seems to me that uh, this is it's not a constitutional analysis, but when you think about uh, money in politics, uh, the proportions may have changed, but at least when I was running for office and it never you know, it's, a, it's different in Vermont, but still, uh, in terms of the magnitude, but I don't think different in the proportions. You know, 90% of what you had to spend on a campaign were for media ads and people who put together the media ads. And the consultants that I talk about that are honored at the Institute of Politics at Harvard get, uh, you know, 15 or 20% every time they place a media ad. So if you can place $200 million worth of media ads, that's a, that's a pretty good payday. And so when you think about what's distorted American politics, part of it has been, it seems to me, this idea that the, that the public airwaves can be turned into profit by, uh, by, by media corporations. It always seemed to me that one of the more practical ways of running campaigns was just to give every candidate 10 minutes. Uh, the media had to give them on, the, on all the networks, and you, got, you didn't get to use any ads. You had to s sit there and and speak, which <laughs> probably would have meant that I would have lost my first campaign, but <laughs> <laughs> nonetheless, I think it's, but it, the, the point is that, that we're raising money that goes directly, almost directly back into the coffers of um, major corporations. And secondly, uh, the, the other piece that one may not think about, but it's certainly true on the national s s scene, I think, particularly when you talk to uh, uh, senators who are uh, seeking re-election, the, I, I remember talking to a uh, spouse of a sen uh, uh, Jeff Bigaman, who's a senator from New Mexico, his wife Ann Bigaman, who was a very prominent uh, lawyer in, in uh, D.C., telling me when they first came in, she said, I spend every morning, uh, we have to raise five, this is a while back too, we have to raise $5,000 a day, uh, and we do it through breakfast meetings. And she said, we have to do that because we've got to raise, uh, you know, whatever it was, $12 million for Jeff's next Senate meeting. And the, the fact is, it's, it's, that's, an, what distorts it is the time you're taking away from what you should be doing beyond all the, uh, all the other perverse incentives that Jim identified in his, in his remarks. So I think those reasons, um, I said, lend, lend itself to really trying to grapple here with, with some way to figure uh, the way out of it. Uh, because I think otherwise, um, you know, you're never, you're never going to match George Soros or on the other side, um, the Koch brothers. Your question. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, my name's Mike Palmer, and one of the hats I wear is uh, chair of the public education section of the Vermont Bar Association. And I want to uh, pick up on something that Emerson Lynn said, uh, uh, I guess it was probably about 40 minutes ago by now. Uh, he, he asked, uh, what can we do uh, to, Im to improve this, other than just talk about it here? About uh, 14 years ago, a group of people worked on putting together what was called the Vermont Consensus Council. And it was modeled after consensus councils in other states. In fact, there's a national consensus council that was uh, pushing this effort. And the idea was to provide a place at the state level to um, help resolve disputes between um, 
uh, citizens and arms of the government and different agencies, uh, a lot of what we are talking about here. Uh, unfortunately, that uh, particular effort uh, did not reach fruition, um, and I won't go into the reasons why, but it, it's a possibility to re, uh, re-examine that and to uh, look at uh, bringing something like that uh, back again. It's an institutional version of what you're talking about or what we've talked about this morning in terms of uh, civility, um, resolving conflicts in a, uh, with a process that is respectful and that reaches uh, agreement around something that satisfies the interest of the various participants. Uh, there are different models for this around the country, and one of the best is the Consensus Building Institute in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, led by uh, Larry uh, Suskind. Uh, and it's something I just would throw out there. Uh, should we re-examine, re, uh, look at that uh, again? Uh, we have different political leadership now, um, which might be more uh, open to that idea. Emerson. Uh, just an observation. You have to remember that you, and this will be seem counterintuitive in this group, you don't communicate through information. You communicate through identity. And you know, this is something that just, it's a given at this point. And one of the things that's always interests me about Vermont, and to your point specifically, is that you know Vermont does a particularly poor job at so many different levels in branding itself. We communicate in silos. We don't. We you know, it's kind of your turf building. Everybody's got their little uh, their little bit of turf, and it's really not uh, you know conducive to you know talk to one another. But the point is, is that I've always wondered you know why. How do we ever get from here to there? if we don't start branding ourselves as the place that we would like to be and the place that we'd like for people to understand us to be. And you know, this conversation keeps going around and around and around, but we don't ever really take it to that next level. And it's like, you know, I happen to agree with the, with the woman earlier who talked about the need uh, for education. You know, I've long advocated that Vermont has the ability to establish itself as the education state. And when you market yourself as the education state, if you brand yourself as the education state, then what happens is that people start to believe what they hear. But you really have to be very aggressive in branding yourself as that entity. Well, the same thing goes along with uh, your idea on civility and, and, and conversation. You know, isn't there a way to brand ourselves as that place? I mean, you know, uh, Congressman Leach was talking about, you know, from the outside recognizing Vermont as a place that has town meetings. That's good, that's a start. What we all know is the dirty little secret in Vermont is that we've got about 10, 15 percent attendance uh, at our town meeting days. Uh, so, you know, we've got something that we can build on, but we just need to, to amplify that. But, you know, this to me is you know, also part and parcel of the, the responsibility of our elected leaders uh, and the people in the legislature as well as the governor's office in that you have to take command of the bully pulpit. And this has to be part of the conversation on a daily on a daily availability. You know, these are just core issues that need to be articulated. Uh, and, you know, the problem, getting back to the whole bit on negative advertising or negative campaigns, the problem is that, that negative campaigns work. And, you know, that's why they're conducted is because they work. And until we're able to, to put up a counter, a countervailing example of why they don't work, uh, we're going to continue to reach some of this. And the way that you have to combat that is articulating as a society that this isn't who we want to be. But it can't be you know, something that's be beneath the radar. It has to be something that's articulated by our leaders. Your question, please. I was intrigued by the role of the press in all this. And full disclosure, I, I wasn't in the press as long as, as Chris or Emerson. I was only in it for 20 years, um, a little bit of it here. Um, but a couple of things struck me, and I was wondering if you could expand on it. Uh, one uh, proposition was that the media, the sort of uh, 
diffused media, the, 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 the Huffington Post, the social media, that sort of thing, was partially to blame for a lack of civility. Uh, what I didn't hear was any notion that the press, for reasons that probably vary from economics, um, from the desire to have access rather than to be, be willing to take on politicians and make them scared. And Emerson, when you said that the fifth floor didn't want to say stuff because they were afraid of the public, that's pretty chilling. And that's a good question for you to be asking and for everybody of the press. But is it possible that rather than looking at this sort of cacophony of noise that is the hallmark of America since its founding um, as something to be avoided on, under the guise of civility, is it, is it not the responsibility of, of the, the, the mainstream press to not only embrace that, but act as that arbiter and act as a truth teller rather than a stenographer? Emerson. Well, it kind of depends on your on your point of view. Uh, you know, in my particular, and that's the only thing I can address right now. But in my particular role, that's precisely what I what I do. Uh, you know, I take in all the information that I possibly can. Sorry about that. Take in all the information I can, and then uh, render the judgment. But also, you know, figure out you know where the truth of the matter is, if I can do that. And you know, I. I do believe that that's our calling. I do believe that that's our responsibility. You know, I, I think one of the real problems that, that you have uh, is not the difference in voices. Uh, I think it's the fact that you've got nobody, you know, we've lost our editors. You know, we've lost the filters. And so it, it's a little like everybody's voice is given equal weight. Uh, and that's just not true. It's just not true. Uh, you know, there are people who spend their lives, uh, you know, understanding a particular issue and to give, uh, you know, somebody who doesn't spend their lives on that issue equal weight uh, in a discussion is just not doing the community any good. So, no, I do think that that's our responsibility. And I think it's an endless drive, as a matter of fact. Uh, to create, and, and I think that's one of the things I'm trying to do right now uh, in, with this discussion. You know, I think that's my fear is that we're losing that ability and that willingness and we've not, we're not creating that public space out there uh, for people to be able to articulate without that fear. And I think that that is so fundamentally wrong. Um, not only that, not only is it wrong, but it is so self-defeating in establishing public policy directions. You, you can't do that. And, you know, the, the, if you don't think that people haven't figured this out, you're wrong. Because when you have a weakened ability to refine and to get at the truth of the matter, then the opposition out there wakes up to it immediately and they understand what fertile territory they have to advance their own causes. Deb? Um, it, it comes back, I think, to what Congressman Leach said earlier, but maybe in a different context, which is that um, we are without referee. And it used to be the press could credibly perform that role of referee. And one of the things I've observed since I've been in politics here, which was only since 1998, so it's not as long as many people, um, is that we have lost our political press corps. Um, and to the extent that uh, there exists one, very often it's a revolving door. So it's people who don't develop the expertise or the relationships. And there's now a formula for articles where you get one side and then you have to see get the other side and you give them equal weight, as Emerson said. There isn't a, a way to, to, um, to help readers um, really understand issues in any meaningful way. And then on top of it, <coughs> As more and more people are self-publishing, there really is uh, is no referee. And then, uh, just to explain to you what the fifth floor was probably talking about, I haven't been part of these conversations, but I've been in politics and I've had things I've said taken out of context. What they're afraid of is that ad that takes half of a sentence and says that they stand for something or argued for something that they had nothing to do with. But you could always parse a sentence to come out with, uh, with you know, a narrative. They lose control of the narrative because of how, um, how there is no referee either when it comes to political advertising. If you've got money, you can say anything. And an example in the last election was um, 
the Democratic leadership were attacked for proposing lots of taxes, when actually um, the Democratic leadership um, was against it and didn't bring it to the floor, but allowed committee, de committee debate on it. Um, the leadership allowed a discussion. And there were quotes that were taken from leadership that was framed to say something that was exactly not true. But there's First Amendment rights of free speech, and a million dollars was put behind this, incidentally. It wasn't just little money here and there. Someone spent a million dollars to put out information that was factually inaccurate, and there is no real recourse to that. So, uh, so it all comes back to that cycle of, and this was, you know, a, a campaign finance reform, and how do we, how do we uh, make sure that the messages that folks are hearing are uh, based in fact? Your question, please. We spoke earlier about um, signing our opinion, so I'm Trish Alley. And I resonate with Paul Gillies' comment earlier about reaching frustration, which I did long before coming close to 100. And it got so bad that I had a board member who would respectfully listen, listen to my venting and then when I came up for air would say, and how is this contributing to your personal development? <laughs> so I decided that before I could change anyone else's mind, I had to change my own. Not necessarily in what I believe, but in how I think and in how I present my beliefs and how I listen to others. I haven't given up venting completely. I try to do it in the shower and I sing publicly. <laughs> Yesterday, I had the privilege of congratulating sixth graders who are graduating um, out of our um, after school program in, in Greensboro. And I said to them that I wanted to tell them something I wished someone had said to me when I was leaving sixth grade. At Wonder and Wisdom, we do practice nonviolent communication. Um, which is using life-affirming words, language, um, and we do practice some mindfulness. And I said, you know, remember when you were like little and you used to go eh to each other and the, your friend would go eh back? I said, life has a way of doing that and the ehs get even bigger. So, I'm asking you next time and every time you get nah in life to stop and ask yourself two questions. One is who am I? And the other is and what do I most deeply want in my life? And then decide whether to eh or not <laughs> or to respond in a different way. Parker Palmer, I think, refers to this brilliantly in his book, Healing the Heart of Democracy, the, the courage to create um, a politics worthy of the human spirit as working in between humility and chutzpah. And I think these stories that all of us in this room have are really important, and I'd like to hear other stories, if you're willing, of when you stood between humility and chutzpah and decided whether to go eh or not. Actually, what you're doing in that is moving your response into a different part of the brain. So there's real neuroscience that supports this now, which is so cool. <laughs> Thank you for your comments. Your question. Uh, yeah, and forgive me if my question sounds a little bit like a ramble. I drove up from Wyndham County and I'm running on two hours of sleep and lots of coffee. Um, I, I'm i Brandon Betham. I uh, actually am originally from California, uh, Los Angeles in particular, and I, uh, I came out to Vermont to attend Marlboro College uh, down in Wyndham County. <laughs> um, and part, I was attracted to Vermont and to Marlboro in particular because of the the, the level of civility in comparison to California and Los Angeles politics and, and Marlboro, which, whose college governance operates in the town meeting fashion that many of our towns are. Um, and I plan to stay here. But I, and I guess my, my question is, I, I look around the room and I see maybe a handful of young folk. <laughs> um, and it's not, 
atypical of other gatherings like this across Vermont and pretty much across the country. Um, and my question is, we talking about civility is fantastic uh, and, and figuring out how to work that now, but how are we working with the generation to come, the generation that's growing up in sound bites uh, mm -hmm. where attack ads are norms, and uh, how, how do we work to, to not only promote civility for the future generation of leaders, but to also <coughs> lead by example? It's a good question. Thank you. Paul Costello. We've wrestled with this a lot. We run a lot of community conversations, and it's very difficult to get young people to come to them. Um, who comes? Confident people, not just extroverts, but confident people, usually people who feel secure in themselves and are doing okay, um, to a general public meeting on, on the future or on an intellectual subject. So young people don't come yet. You have to go to them. You have to speak their language and you have to go to where they are and then you have to invite them again and again to public process and you have to give them a sense that they have a meaningful role to play, they have a leadership role to play and, and that's deeply challenging for a, you know, an event that's a one-time thing like this. The, oth the other people who aren't here are the low-income folks. Um, it's very difficult to bring people who feel disenfranchised. We're all worried about that 50% that aren't voting and aren't participating and um, they don't necessarily see the conversation as one for them or that benefits them or that their voice is, is valued. And how do we respond to that, I think, is, is, is another one of those fundamental challenges. So I, I don't have a quick answer for it. But Paul Burns. I don't necessarily have the answer to that, but I, I will say, as, as some of you uh, probably know, um, uh, my organization employs uh, young people over the course of the summer to knock on doors from one end of the state to the other on, um, on one or another issue to try to encourage people to get involved. So it's, it's civic uh, engagement for sure um, and done in a way that is kind of pure democracy, door to door, face to face, one conversation after another, inviting conversation and, and taking a real risk. If you're a young person, uh, knocking on doors in neighborhoods you've never been to, talking to, person, to people about an issue, um, and at the end asking them if they'd like to make a, a, a financial contribution is character building work uh, if you've never done it. It's challenging and we've got 40 people every single day uh, now going out across the state. We'll be knocking on about 70,000 doors over the course of the summer. So that's not a one-time event, but it's, it's a way of engaging people because I think they, they understand that it is through this process that they can make a difference. They believe in that and that they believe that in a place like this, if they engage enough people and give those folks an opportunity to weigh in with their elected officials, that something positive can happen. And that, and that that thing that can happen is meaningful in their lives. Uh, in this case, they happen to be arguing that genetically modified food should have a label so that you know when you're at the store whether or not you're buying something like that that could have an impact on your health or your family's health. Well, that actually matters to those folks, and they would like Vermont to be the first state to do that. And so it's been incredibly empowering for them. I think all of that's part of the process. Jeff. Just a, a, a comment about uh, that, that demographic, I guess, and, and at both at, at Harvard and, and elsewhere, I'm three, with three daughters under 30 as well. Um, th this, it, I was really struck by, by talking to, to one of the students and we were debating the uh, qualifications of a candidate for political office and I said, well, the senator has, has spent, uh, you know, 30 years uh, in public service and the student said well where and I said well in the Senate and she said what is it what does that have to do with public service <laughs> uh, and that it actually is reflection of I think if you look at the if you look at the most active most uh, s civic and internationally engaged students now uh, they're interested in uh, NGOs non-governmental organizations or they're interested in community building very few of them are uh, at least compared to my generation, look to public ser think of public service in terms of uh, politics. And, and it's reflected even, and one, one more example of that, very bright Harvard Law student uh, uh, who 
uh, as Harvard Law students tend to do. I was thinking about days when he was going to be in a confirmation hearing uh, for a federal judgeship, maybe for the U.S. Supreme Court, and, and had some reason to think that along those lines. Uh, and so he was asking me about an article he was going to write, and I said, no, it seems like a good topic. And he said, well, I'm concerned about writing it because if I'm in a confirmation here, tw uh, hearing 25 years from now, it may be brought up as a, a reason not to confirm me. And I thought, well, there's two comments about how far <laughs> removed we are from uh, the kind of civility in the best sense in our public discourse at the highest level. And um, I think one of the impacts of that is to move an entire generation, really, to look at other ways they can uh, affect public service. That's not a bad thing, but it, it's, a, I think, a sad comment on uh, how, how distant our, our leaders on a national scale have, have gotten from encouraging people to, uh, to participate. We need to move on. We're in the last uh, 15 minutes of our session this morning. So I'm going to ask the four of you who are standing to ask questions uh, to do them uh, briefly, and we'll get some quick response so that we can be sure to end on time, which is, I think, a very civil thing to do. <laughs> Your question, please. So I, I want to uh, move from talk into action. I work as the town manager in New Hampshire. I'm going to out myself. And I drove two hours to come here to this conference. I am a member of the Vermont Bar. And we are having some very difficult conversations in northern New Hampshire with the Hydro-Quebec lines coming through. And you can drive up Route 3 and see signs that say, uh, Northern Pass can kiss my ass. And I, I want to say um, to the people that have those signs, could you use your big people words? <laughs> <laughs> so I want to, again, talk to, uh, go to, from talk to action. Um, we have an organization called New Hampshire Listens which is building on the slow democracy movement. And um, I think we need to move away from the 30 second sound bites on Fox Noise into meaningful conversations and having time like this to get your, express your thoughts in a, in a meaningful way. So I don't know uh, what other people have in terms of how are we gonna fix this problem, but I wanted to at least offer that to the equation. Thank you. Any questions, any uh, comments on that? Okay. Deb? Well, we've actually, I, I had the good fortune of participating in the Energy Siting Commission, um, which was a commission that was formed to take a new look at how we make siting decisions for uh, all of uh, renewable and non-renewable energy producers here in Vermont. And there was a lot of conversation about how these big projects divide communities. And communities that have similar kinds of signs, um, I'm not sure they, they use um, words you can't use at the dinner table, but the, um, but the passion is there and, uh, and it's black and white. And um, there was a lot of conversation about how, um, what we can do about that. People have differences of opinions, and at the end of the day, um, it's a zero-sum game. There are winners and losers. And many people pointed to that being the problem with some of these uh, regulatory issues. And so the recommendation of the Siting Commission uh, were designed, some of the recommendations were, were designed to require for, these large, for the larger complex projects a front-loaded process of conversation in communities because part of what happens is when people feel like s they don't have control and something's going to be pushed down their their throats without them having uh, any say at all um, you dig in and uh, where where there might be points of compromise now in some cases there aren't it is black and white people you know particularly on debates like abortion debates and and some some of these energy debates there are people who are uncompromising their ideologues on whatever the issue is and that makes it more complicated but in my experience as uh, secretary of state working for municipalities for you know so long and and now as at the agency, um, you can get much farther if you front load a public process. As a practical matter, it's not always clear what are going to be those divisive issues, but uh, in a large, you know, you can often pick them out. Uh, you don't always get it right. Your question, please. Thank you. Steve Monahan. Um, and I think I've, I've heard a lot uh, today. I do think, uh, first, that, that civility in my definition isn't so much about politeness. I think it's about listening 
and education, uh, understanding and being willing to listen and possibly change your mind. And I think when we talk about negativity in politics and things like that, and we like to point to the press or those pundits, but really it's us. And if you want to change that, we have to start asking better questions of the people who run for office and not accept vote for me because you know that guy, <laughs> but more, more something along the lines of what do you stand for? What are you going to do? What are the positive things? Or even what is your vision of government? Is it something that will help or is it something merely to be put up with? Uh, and I think if we started asking those questions and started teaching our children that kind of discourse, ask for the facts behind the statement and the belief, sure you have a belief, what is the basis for that, then that's where we'll go and that's how we'll promote this discussion. But we too often like to fall back, I myself, to the witty remark and the quick retort and move on to the next question and uh, not ever get to the sound underneath. And that's where I think we need to focus and I do think it starts with education of our children. Thank you for your comments. Your question. Well, I, I couldn't resist taking a second bite at the apple after hearing the conversation about the role of the press. <clears throat> and uh, my question is, what is truth? And you, uh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting your name, but you mentioned gathering information and sort of trying to decipher what the truth is in any political discourse. Um, I think that perhaps at this point in time, we're having a, a little bit of a crisis over what kinds of knowledge people will accept as authoritative. Scientific knowledge, you know, uh, religious beliefs, uh, and some are fact and some are more uh, not so hard and uh, well defined. So what is truth and where do we look to for objective information that can unify us? Emerson? Well, you know, I think my first response to that is that nobody can define, obviously, uh, what it is uh, categorically, but what you can, what you can also, uh, the response to that is I can tell you what it isn't. Uh, and what it isn't, generally speaking, is a very narrow conversation. Uh, and I think that's one of the responsibilities that we have, uh, and kind of to my point, is that you have to be very inclusive uh, in gathering the information so that people go, you, whether or not you go to one source or 20 sources, the fact is that you, you know, open yourself to a lot of the discussion. You know, the, the problem comes, uh, you know, and, and it's really true in, uh, in Vermont, it's true with the United uh, decision. You know, we have this problem of perfection being the enemy of the good, uh, and so we, we insist on absolute purity when purity doesn't exist. You know, absolute truth doesn't exist either. You know, what we're trying to do is just get the ball a little bit further down uh, the, the court. And that's, you know, that's my point, is that we, we just have to be inclusive. We have to be open. You know, we have to invite all opinions, and we have to make it very clear to people that you can't base your decisions on one particular source. I think it also gets down to, you know, figuring out who we are as human beings and how we communicate. Uh, what I thought was in another very counterintuitive thing, particularly to people like me, uh, is that, you know, we don't learn and we don't communicate uh, as much through logic as we think we do. Uh, we communicate through emotion. Uh, and, you know, this is what they really are, are starting to figure out now in terms of how our brains work is that, you know, reason is that tiny little man who sits on this huge elephant of emotion. Uh, and if we delude ourselves any other way, uh, you know, we're fooling ourselves. And so it kind of gives you a good uh, visual perspective on the challenge ahead. Uh, but it also opens the discussion and, and to the importance of making sure that when you realize that, how incumbent it is upon us to really sit and listen to other people. You know, I'm in the job, I, I've got the business of, of listening to people and to writing editorials and listening to one side and listening to the other and then making up my own mind and then articulating the, the debate. And you know, very, very rarely am I ever in a situation where if I am able to talk to both people, both sides of it, and particularly if they're both in the room at the same time, that I can't come up with a pretty civil 
response to it. And I think that in, that's the secret to communication, uh, whether or not it's at the cr congressional level or at the local level, is that you just have to work hard to bring both sides together to hear the argument. That's what's, that, but, but it, you know, we don't want to do that because that's really hard. It's a lot easier just to listen to the people that we want to listen to. And that's the problem. So truth is, is a very difficult, obviously you can't define it, but it's a process and it, it's a very difficult process, but you have to assimilate as much information as you can. Paul Costello. Well, I don't know that anything needs to be added to that, but we're, we're at a point in our history where we don't have a single external referent. You know, there's no platonic perfection that we all can touch. We are a diverse society in terms of religious fundamentals. There's no quick answers to what truth is. We, we end up, by default, going to William James, I think, and pragmatism, that we that it's a process of discovery that requires mutual participation and um, deep look, a deep, honest look at the facts and divergent points of view from all sides of a, all, all around the, the crystal of of, uh, of any one issue, and and that's a a fundamental responsibility to us. I think it, it that you know we don't live in a block universe where all the answers are quick and easy, where true believers get to decide. It's a deep discourse that's required of us to uh, realize the experiment of democracy. Paul Burns. Well, just uh, very briefly, I just want to say that there are some truths out there, and, and I don't think it's always true that it is somewhere in between what two uh, opposing viewpoints uh, may say. For instance, there is such a thing as climate change now, and that is a truth. Um, and though many people out there dispute it, uh, it's actually it, it is a fact, and I think it's appropriate for us to recognize certain facts like that. There are times when the media, for instance, has uh, commented, uh, after quoting somebody talking about where the president uh, may have been born in Kenya, uh, the reporter would say, and that is factually untrue. Um, and you very rarely hear a media person coming on and actually making a corrective statement like that, but I, I think uh, when you hear it and when you know it to be factually untrue, it is incumbent upon the media in that case to actually make that clear. Emerson? I just want to respond real quickly to that. I think, that, I think that's true, uh, but you can take it to, uh, to extremes. And, and I had to moderate a debate at UVM uh, last year between Bill McKibben and who obviously took his position on, on global warming and then the purpose of the debate is to have a debate. And so we had another individual who you know, gave the opposing argument. What was fascinating about it is Mr. McKibben, who's a friend of mine, but uh, made the argument that this debate shouldn't be, that the person had no right to be up on the podium to have the debate, and that's wrong. You know, you, you, can, uh, you can agree to disagree on, on the subject, but you have to be able to be, you have to be willing to hear what the other person says, because if you don't, you weaken your own argument. And you're our final question. Chris, uh, first, thanks for being the moderator. You've done an excellent job. Um, you've made the terrible mistake of leaving the last question to both a lawyer and a politician. <laughs> um, a couple of quick comments and a demonstration of civility. Congressman Leach, just for your information, I think Vermont is a special place. In my political role, I serve as the Senate Minority Leader, and the Senate Majority Leader and I attend lunch on a weekly basis. We know each other's families, and I think that's part of the reason that the Vermont Senate this year is actually doing a much better job. Secretary Markowitz, as the lead sponsor of S30, the Wind Moratorium Bill, uh, let me say I am very sorry to hear that any of the supporters of that bill have taken your office to task. Um, conversely, I would like to thank you for lending the services of Chris Recchia to the discussion because I think he is doing yeoman's work to keep that discussion alive and I think that's critically important for the entire discussion. Paul Burns, I'm going to end with you. Um, <laughs> frankly, I came to this conference because I saw your name was on the list of panelists. And as part of the wind discussion, um, I had to find myself the subject of several pieces, and I don't know who wrote them in your particular website, but essentially I was called things like um, a climate change denier, um, I didn't believe in evolution, um, and I, I was finding it comical only because in the very same website, if I looked a little deeper, I could find my name being called a saint for advancing the bottle bill. 
Um, so I, I found it all very comical. But there was one regret that I had at the end of the session. In my first trial attorney experience 30 years ago, I had the good fortune of beating a seasoned prosecutor in a criminal trial. At the end of the trial, he approached my table, and I thought he was going to clock me. <laughs> and instead, he reached out his hand, and he said, you did a good job. And to me, that was all the difference. And for 30 years now, I've conducted jury trials exactly the same way. No matter who the opponent is by way of an attorney, I have always gone up and shaken that person's hand. We know we will be at each other again some point in the future, or we may be on the same side some point in the future. But maintaining that civility in the courtroom is critically important. And I hope I have brought that same spirit into the legislature. And I'm sure I am just as guilty as anybody else of having the passionate speeches that have brought to somebody the feeling like they were being vilified. And I regret that. But I regret one thing in particular. And that is at the very end of the session, you and I never had a chance to do what I hope to be a demonstration of civility. So let's make amends. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, thank our panelists uh, for a great discussion that just flew by. And let's have uh, special thanks to Jim Leach for coming all the way up to Vermont. Some of you uh, may know that he has announced his decision to step down uh, from the chair, the humanities, or whatever the title is. And uh, he has had a remarkable impact. Uh, one of the things he did was a 50-state tour that was a civility tour. And to go to all 50 states and preach this is really a job that we want to thank you for, for doing that. And finally, we have to thank all of you, because this is June 1st. It's a beautiful day out. It's a Saturday, so go enjoy it.